case uh, you know any any ideas come up and we will have a round of uh, questions and discussions towards the end i would like this to be uh, uh, an engaging session so lots of ideas from you will help uh, there will be times wherein i'll ask you to come up with ideas and you can write those in the chat box we have seen as so many of the speakers have just said paradigm shifts all around us the world is changing and there is much more to go our children in school today will not really know we don't know and they don't know and the parents don't know what careers are they going to get into what kind of skills do they really require for the future none of us have seen the future we never did but the pace of change has changed phenomenally and the future 80 years down the line when our children in school today in a nursery classroom today or in a primary classroom today will be retiring most of the jobs that will exist at that point of time even those ideas have not been conceptualized today people no longer only change jobs it's already changed to people changing careers every 5 years a 5 year old is already tech savvy and by the time they are 10 they need to know everything they are expecting logical answers and solutions from us you cannot take a child for granted anymore and that is how it should be um education as we've all seen we moved from physical schools to virtual schools and probably fairly soon uh, to hybrid model of schools we are moving from from this utter rat race of of competence who's more competent at competition to competencies or actually building skills and competencies which was so much missing and always was needed we move we've moved in a big way the not such a good way in certain ways and has its advantages which cannot be known from reference books to google we've moved from the age of information explosion quite literally all around us to today actually an age of information or disinformation rather not information anymore because your news and my news is different everything that we see on media or social media we don't know what's right and what's wrong it's no longer gospel truth it's no longer it's somebody's news what you see and what i see could be very very different because social media and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on decides this everything around us we are no longer living in a world wherein we could probably believe in similar things diversity is one thing and needs to be celebrated but polarization and hatred is not to be developed in this world that will kill our planet so there's a lot of all that happening in now more than ever our children really need to be able to understand different perspectives now more than ever we need to be moving into a space where where we think critically now what do we mean by these ideas of thinking critically or creatively let's look a little more deeply into that and why do we why are we talking here when we are talking about education why are we talking here about all these ideas well i'll just take john dewey's quote here education is not just preparation for life but education is life itself the technology is here to stay we can either be tamed by it or actually tame it to use it to the best advantage we have to decide which side we have to be we cannot escape this change we have to we've all seen it and we've done it beautifully during this pandemic we've also in the process seen so many advantages and so many opportunities that it also holds alongside so let's put all that to the same use to some use here we cannot expect education to go on the way it did for years and years there has to be there is always already radical change happening around us every disruption has its positive sides and this radical change in education i think was long since called for but now it's here to stay uh everything that can be converted into an algorithm will not be a job for human beings in very near future we need our children to be human 
we need our children to build skills that will be really required which machines cannot build they are getting more and more limited and think about it are we really teaching those kind of skills in our curriculum what do we need to do to ensure that our children are genuinely ready for what what lies ahead then what can we do all this is there then what do we do what will be tomorrow is changing so whatever information we try to teach them today is available at the click of a button there's no point doing that they will have to be lifelong learners there is no option and we as teachers moved from being sage on stage to facilitators and today we're actually no longer just facilitators also we're co-learners so we we our role has changed phenomenally now how does it function in this manner we really need to ensure the children learn how to learn or meta cognition and learning how to learn is one of the very key skills that we need to give them today we need to build growth mindsets we need to encourage collaboration and collaborative thinking and teamwork that is one thing that is here to stay we need to encourage problem solving problem solving so many people have mentioned it as a skill and it is done time and again but then are we really talking problem solving or even identifying the right problem and really defining it before we can even think about solving it that too takes a lot of critical thinking so it's moved to that as well what is the problem to be solved and how do we innovate and how do we reach where we want to reach all of this needs to be done with empathy with resilience with emotional intelligence these are becoming some of the very central tenets central ideas or central skills that human beings will require and possibly machines will not have we are living at the same time in a world or our children are also living in a world of instant gratification we are not or no longer naturally learning resilience as we used to earlier so we have to put in the effort to make that happen and that again falls to education to do development around us has to be sustainable we as human beings have plundered and plundered the planet and um, it's a famous saying by one of the very important thinkers who said that if you remove all insects from the earth within 50 years all life forms will disappear but if we remove all human beings from the earth within 50 years actually all other life forms will flourish so we really need to rethink the way we are and what we are to our planet and reconstruct our whole system around it otherwise we are very much on the brink of the sixth extinction therefore globally these are the skills we need and therefore the entire globe is actually talking about this is what we need we need critical thinking we need the ability to argue effectively and with empathy we need the ability to challenge injustice and inequalities we need to build a society that really deems fit uh, that is fit for our children to grow up in and so on and so forth you can refer to this uh, later i have already discussed these so i'll not stay or stay on on this slide much and this is what we keep hearing about the various 21st century skills now i haven't defined it this is predefined the 21st century skills now if you look at the foundational literacies here they themselves have changed we are no longer talking only literacy and numeracy we are talking scientific literacy ict literacy very key can you imagine uh, a, a work uh, employee who is not ict literate anymore even in teaching can you think about it no we've had to adapt financial literacy very key and something that has often been ignored but has always was always supposed to be part of the foundational literacies is cultural and civic literacy at the center of this you see the competencies and the competencies of course we've all spoken about communication collaboration creativity and critical thinking and then you have character qualities which will help lead to these competencies curiosity initiative 
persistence and grit or resilience that I've spoken about, adaptability, we've all seen it and experienced it through this pandemic, leadership, and leadership is way more than it's often understood, social and cultural awareness. What we've concentrated over the years on, or what education systems, or K-12 education and even higher education largely has become, is only teaching or training the mind. It's, as Ken Robinson puts it, are we using our bodies as transport to carry around the heads? Are we only here teaching the heads? Even if you think of the Bloom's taxonomy, there are three, three domains for learning. Cognitive is only one of them. There is the effective domain, which needs to get the center stage, which is all about emotions and attitude and, and, and thought building and feeling. There is the psychomotor domain, which also needs to be at the center stage. We need to start thinking the whole being when we are thinking education. We cannot think only, only academic inflation in the mind. Uh, moving on, now how does that work? We're all born to learn. It's as simple as that. We're all born and we learn for the sake of learning. Think of a child, Think. look at the smile at this child, uh, on the face of this child. It's probably the smile for being able to stand up for the first time, probably the smile for being able to take the first step. Who teaches us to walk? Who teaches us to talk? Walking and talking are some of the toughest skills that a human being can acquire. And yet children, even before they for the first time step into the school, and this is not me, this is from Maria Montessori, they already acquire it. How does that happen and how does that work? So language later, we try to teach them a second language, a third language, and we make such a mess of it. We say there'll be a noun, there'll be a verb, and then all sorts of concepts and intricacies and complexities get into it, and we make a mess out of it. But what really works is the acquisition of that skill from the environment around. Who is the teacher then? The entire environment. And why is this child learning or being able to learn? The child is not told, oh, if you don't walk, you know, I'll not give you a chocolate. If you, if you don't speak now, I'll... we don't do praise and punishment. We don't use gifts and so on. We, we simply let them be. And what happens is at their own pace and in their own time and in their own manner, these three are very important and very key ideas here. They learn and the environment is the teacher and the innate ability to learn is what persists. They fall endlessly and they don't stop. They never stop. None of the fall is potent enough to make a child feel that no, I should stop trying. The child continues and continues to try endlessly. They just give it a go. And that's the beauty of childhood. They don't believe in what we later end up making them believe in, failure. The idea of failure is no longer, is not there. And that's a very key concept. That's what leads to something known as growth mindset. And I'll come to that. Uh, are we educating children out of their creative capacities? They're already, they're born creative. They all have it in them, but through the schooling system, and I would recommend everybody to watch the video by Ken Robinson. I have uh, put the link later. Very important to think, are we really getting it out or sucking it out of them and how and why? And what can we then do while we still are in the same structure or system of education? How do we ensure that this doesn't happen? That that creativity is enhanced because that's a much needed skill that they would require. So we move on. Look at this picture and what does it tell you? This is from the time of the industrial revolution. One thing I wish we could talk easily here, but I can't look at the chat box right now as I'm sharing the screen. One thing that you would notice, everybody is regimented in straight rows doing exactly the same thing. They're drawing. But is this creativity? No. Is this art? Well, no. 
this is copying this is control c control v as we would call it probably in today's lingo this is not creativity this is not creative exploration and this is not really art this is one of the ways in which what taylor gatto calls weapons of mass instruction were designed for a regimented system required or an assembly line system required by the industrial revolution it was way before the 19th century around that time and we never needed it maybe for that century they needed workers who would just doggedly agree to instruction and not use their brains and therefore they created a system for that going back to our own system in india we pretty much had the gurukul system and we one of the oldest of things we had six layers of the guru or the teacher it began with what we today also use adhyapak adhyapak the person who would deliver information and this was the lowest level of the teacher it began with this you can also simultaneously think of the bloom's taxonomy which i'm sure most of you are already aware of you could easily see the correlation we had the adhyapak then the second level we had the upadhyay whose role was to give understanding and ensure that that information is also clearly understood the concept is clear and then came the acharya who hasn't heard of dronacharya the acharya's job was to ensure that you're able to build the skill or the competence and you're able to use it then the pandita insight into that learning why and how and where and when to use it why and why not questioning it insight and thinking through it and then came the drishta forecasting evaluating vision envisioning the future envisioning ideas creating thinking innovating the drishta and top of the ladder the guru wisdom when you had all of this then you got then you could be aspiring for something known as wisdom the guru could be anything it wasn't necessarily a human being could be anything that inspired you that that ignited that creative spark and that made you do the things that you're meant to do think of this system and think of this system moving into the british introduced it in india and we are still stuck with it that's post colonial india but i think high time we can get over it we've all talked about it for years and years and there have been a lot of pressures and so on which have not allowed us to move beyond it even the earlier national education policy did discuss this but we've not seen uh, the implementation similarly we all seen as teachers a lot of clutches binding it us there is the new education policy 2020 now and i really hope it also very very clearly talks about ideas like this and it raises all the right questions there is a sort of a spine to it rather than a stick to the policy and let's really hope that that happens in reality fairly soon now come to think of these ideas what we had and what we have today think of these ideas i have some thoughts put together here on this slide each time we point out an error are we offending the child's innate freedom of spirit the child's sense of self as we saw a while ago the child is born to learn there is an innate ability within us to learn but there is too much error pointing there is too much of no don't do this and no don't do that both by parents and teachers and various other adults around and that over a period of time can lead to constriction where are we leaving that innate freedom yes we do need structure this doesn't mean to say that we don't need structure but saying just no is not really providing structure let's respect that spontaneity the 100 languages of children everything that a child is naturally doing is actually creating some form of learning play is learning and i think that idea has been explored beyond measure already and you can read about it now if a child has to be rewarded or punished 
it means he or she lacks the capacity to guide herself or himself now we need to build into the environment control of error so that the child naturally knows that this is something that didn't work out well no it didn't fit and so i need to and that's what you see in the montessori didactic material which is not just for pre primary it is for a lot of it moves beyond and control of error also needs to be built into each and every resource that a child uses could be a textbook could be a worksheet and we can build in an example a simple example would be when you're putting in mcqs you are in a way building control of error when you're giving a worked example alongside and some mcq you're in a way building some kind of control of error and support everything that we give to a child in the classroom needs to be such that can be managed independently we need to assume that there is no nobody to help and the child is able to do it independently a very important a very key idea is feedback it's at the center of everything that we do now if something is wrong it is wrong so do we say it's it's wrong so don't do it do we never say that no that doesn't mean that by saying that we have to not say no this is not this is very often construed as the meaning but this isn't the meaning we say not yet we define the outcome we define the learning outcome fairly clearly we share an exemplar we share where and very very clearly in very detailed rubrics and in the way that the child will understand depending on the age group we make it clear what is needed what the goal is and then it's the self spirit or self direction of the child that ultimately will make them reach there each time we assess each time they come to you with a painting you say wonderful work you put in appreciation but you also put in some constructive feedback you say you know what what if i added this to it what if you tried this also would you like to probably it will be better think about it and then let them go and explore we don't say you're not going doing fine we don't say something is wrong but we do say not yet we're not yet quite there the power of not yet is amazing it's not telling the child that you can't do it it's always telling the child you can and you can explore much more it it's leaving the path open so try it yourself and you will know and i would encourage everybody to read more on growth mindsets it will give you more on that now how do we do all this how do we ensure that in the real time classrooms we really make all this happen well all children are born artists and the problem is to remain the artist as they grow up as we have just now seen so all children have it in them now how do we take it out and how do we uh, make it emerge and develop rather than crushed thinking questions are quite an important aspect of it uh many of you may have already heard of the hole in the wall experiment by sukanta mitra and what he did was essentially just to, just for the sake of those who haven't what he did was essentially uh put a computer device and made it accessible with internet to some children who may not have seen it earlier and within a few days we saw dramatic uh improvements dramatic ways in which uh those children were able to learn a lot of things which can be very tough to actually teach in a classroom and then it, it went further and further so in one of the classes he also put in and this was one of the grade fives this question the british empire was a good thing or a bad thing now the children were supposed to come back with their own answers and explore the whole thing on their own and get back what all do you think would have happened in that classroom and how do you think it works what do you think the teacher here was trying to teach thinking questions are the key or think of this question what would change if human bodies could make their own food if we could possibly do photosynthesis instead of plants 
What would change on this planet? What would change around us? Think of this and think of what kind of curiosity you're igniting. That's very, very key before we begin teaching anything. Very often it is ignored, but this is the crux of making any lesson worth the whole while. This is the crux of making any child um, engaged. This is the crux of making any child begin using thinking, could be creative thinking, could be creative, critical thinking and may not be, may not extend beyond uh, a certain point, but, but you can. And there are lots of things that you add to that, which we'll explore. Meanwhile, possibly we can have a lot of questions like this thought about, and you all can put it in the chat box. I would love to see some questions from the chat box. Is it possible? Take a moment, think of a lot of questions that you can put in the chat box. Uh, so I request all the teachers who are listening to ma'am, if they, you have any question to ask her, you can put it in the chat box. Okay, currently I'm not saying asking of questions that we can do, but think of questions that you can ask your students to ignite curiosity. Uh, you, you already have three examples on the screen here. Maybe you can, you can think of more. You're all teachers, you do this every day, quite naturally. So think. There may be many, many. I'm just looking. There is one in the chat box, ma'am. If we could fly, okay, that's good. Can we think more? Think of the topic that you're teaching, any topic, any, any class, any grade level. And to teach that, how could you invert it into something and make a question, put a question out there which makes them think? Don't, don't think of random questions. Try to think of the topic and link it to any concept. For example, I have one here on friction. What would our world be like without friction? What do you think anybody would like to answer that can answer that also in the chat box. What would happen? Any science teachers would like to try? Okay, how is H2O not an acid even when it has two hydrogen atoms? Now that's not a very thinking question. That's a direct question. Think of a thinking question. You have to ignite curiosity. You have to really think of a thinking question. It must make them really explore the answer. Turn the world around kind of question. That's very key. This one will have a straightforward answer, which will probably already be there in your textbook. So it should not be a very common answer. Okay, what do you think would happen if we had no friction? Anyone can answer that here. Okay, and what if everything is very slippery? Think, think more. Okay, just to make you, um, make you find more on this, do check out YouTube today and check out some videos on the idea of friction and what if there was no friction. Just Google it. You will find some really, really uh, funny things out there and maybe some eye openers as science teachers. That's why this is so important. We need to think. We don't need to just look at facts and learn them and, and, and think that this is what works. No, it doesn't. We really need to go beyond that. Okay, now here are some strategies. So of course, the first and foremost strategy is thinking questions, which we just saw, and the kind of questions, and then comes uh, various other strategies. So once you've asked a question, you need to facilitate or as a co-learner work with them for solution fluency. They need to explore solutions, like we were trying to explore solutions. Now children will not always come back with actual solutions. There may be funny answers, which is okay. There may be all kinds of answers, sometimes even unconnected, which is also okay. What we have to encourage is divergent thinking, not convergent thinking. We are not giving them the answer right away. We want them to, to create their own dhobi list. We want them to go wild. We want them to 
to imagine. And that's what we are also working on uh, supporting and creating. So if, if they're imagining things, if they're, if they're thinking wildly, if they're coming up with a lot of diverse perspectives, that's the more the merrier. We also, at the same time, need to provide some guided points there. If they're completely going haywire after a point, you have to give them some time for that. And then also provide some hints that lead them on to finding the right solution. You need to provide some information fluency or information as in not yourself, but a lot of places from where to get that information, maybe the right sources. For example, a while ago on the question to friction, I said, okay, check out Google and you will find certain videos. Now I could have given you a few links of certain videos and said that, okay, look at these also, right? So that will be, I'm providing you information fluency, but I'm not giving it directly to you, but I'm giving you a hint and I want you to go see. I want you, I've already told you what to type there so I know what you'll get, right? So this is the kind of randomness that needs to be there, wherein you're giving them support or guiding them with some support, but you're not really giving things directly. You're letting them at the same time explore. They will explore 20 different things and come back with way more than you expected. And then finally reach the answer. Now add to that the five times why strategy, that works like that works like magic. You will see that. Okay. The five times why strategy, how does that work? Now, if a child ever talked to a child, a five year old, a six year old, uh, and been through this situation where they ask you, why do you think, why does this happen? And you answer. And they get back again with, so why? And you answer that why. And then they again get back with, but why this? You again, possibly answer. And then they again can get back. Just think of five times why on everything. And you would go deeper and deeper in thought about that. That encourages some critical thinking you're really analyzing and, and getting deeper so the five times why strategy it will not necessarily have to be five times each time uh, but the why is very important and so each time please try to bring it in and you will have a lot of curiosity ignited a lot of thinking uh, and and deeper delving in the classroom then differentiating fact and opinion. A lot of information is available out there. Not all of it is correct. Even on Wikipedia, not every information may be correct. So you need, we need to now help learners really identify what is a fact and what is just an opinion. We need to help children actually judge credibility. Who is the author? Uh, are the correct credentials given there? What are the qualifications of the author? Uh, how updated is this website? Uh, how is it and by whom is it? Is it an advertisement in the garb of information? Or is it actual information? What is it? So how to differentiate between these is very essential to even to survive in today's world. This is an essential thing to do. And when children start exploring with this, they start identifying fact or differentiating fact from opinion. And that by itself creates very important information, fluency as we call it. There's information all around, but there is all kinds of wild information. Now out of that, how does a child really end up selecting what is useful and actually, actually adapting it to the required scenario and not getting completely misled? That's very important. Then the next step to building creativity and critical thinking is the idea of looking at patterns. Mathematics, for instance, is all about patterns. And in fact, so are almost all the other uh, subject areas. It's important to connect the dots, the, whether it is the national education policy or any kind of pro progressive educator that you may have met over the years, they will all talk about 
breaking the boundaries between subjects. All subjects do not exist in these boundaries that we have put around them. They, they all exist together as a whole in the real world around us. And so there are interactions and nuances and so on. So that connecting of two, I may have understood one concept from this subject and another from here and another one before earlier. And I'm building on with scaffolding over the years and I'm connecting it all. Connecting those dots is very important. Bringing it together, connecting the dots and then being able to come up with solutions is very important. That is something that we have to keep engaging our learners. In. The kind of questions, the kind of tasks that we assign or design for the classroom have to be tasks that use skills from different streams and which require children to connect the dots, to put, bring it all together. Then we have encouraging divergent thinking and diverse perspectives. The pandemic, I think, has provided an exclusive opportunity for this. Today, we have children working on their climate action projects with children from across the globe. Every second day, children are engaging from other parts of the world. They are talking, they're discussing ideas, what's happening in their country, what is their thought process, what's happening in our country, what's happening in my local scenario and what's happening in the global uh, scenario and how the global and the local can be met, what I can adapt from there, what will not work here and why and how. All these diverse perspectives and being open to somebody else's truth. There is no one truth ever. So being open to all of that is again a very, very key aspect that needs to be built if we want our children to develop creative and critical thinking. World will not survive without this. This is again by itself also one of the very, very uh, key uh, skills or competencies that they need to uh, acquire. Agreeing with, and if you saw in global citizenship, this was one of the things. We have to move away from competition. Competition helped nobody. Life exists only in collaboration. So moving away from competition, and if there is a competition, it is with oneself. I have achieved this, what more can I do? I have been able to organize this, can this be better? This is good, but can it be even better? And therefore the not yet, and therefore the growth mindset. Competing is only with oneself. With others, there is just collaboration because each of the others, just like for you, I may be uh, today for this session, a more knowledgeable other. Similarly, for me, all of you attending the session today are more knowledgeable others. There may be a lot of things that I will learn and take away from you. Uh, every time I conduct a training workshop, it happens. Similarly, each child for the other child in the classroom is a more knowledgeable other, as uh, Lev Vygotsky would put it. But then if there are so many more knowledgeable others, then let's remember I'm not the only teacher. In fact, in the classroom, your walls could be a teacher. Uh, various equipment, the didactic material, for instance, is a teacher and so much more. So there is everything that can be utilized to teach within their house, today we are teaching virtually. So within the home, there can be so many things that can be a teacher. If I am to do a, a, a little experiment, I could tell the child, look, you just watch water boil, just watch milk boil. Why does milk spill over and not water? What do you think happens? There is so much that is usable as a teacher and as a resource. So everything around us is a more knowledgeable other. The more we collaborate with not just personnel, but also things, the better the learning experiences. And therefore, the more creative and the more critical thinking development happens. Again, collaboration will also give us chances or opportunity to understand different perspectives, which we've said is very key uh, to thinking. And of course, teamwork comes with it. Now, another aspect of the next thing is decision-making. It is by itself a skill again, but also a very key element of creativity and critical thinking. At each step, 
the task assigned or the project based learning task assigned will involve some or the other form of decision making right and children need to be able to decide collaboratively perfect if not sometimes individually now in this process they may be going wrong very often and it's very important at this stage also to use the five times why uh it works as a wonderful strategy sometimes you could change it to five times how depending on what the circumstances are but the why and the how are very key they really help with the whole procedure now we've all heard of messy play i would like you to take a moment and look at uh the picture here uh most of you uh will associate it with only early years but it's not limited only to early years teachers just look at the kind of things that the teachers can see in just a few leaves and some some mud and some containers maybe what a child will see is pure play but what a teacher will see you all can think of right as a teacher so much can be done with all of these things messy play is not just for early childhood education messy play is really really how children learn and it continues to be so even into adulthood if we allow it now how playing unguided forced to draw conclusions when you're playing you have to draw certain conclusions you have to come up with decisions you have to find ways of getting around uh, scenarios all that involves decision making all that involves figuring things out on your own and and finding your way in a non linear manner do check out find some time and check out miss frizzles uh, videos on youtube just google them and you will hear this sentence over and again take chances make mistakes get messy that's very key again to building a growth mindset to allowing for those mistakes because each each and every mistake is a is an opportunity to learn provided it is used appropriately and it is also presented appropriately rather than as something scary now the cbsc as well as the national education policy is talking about art integration art integration and why are they all talking about art integration going back to one of the previous slides we said that anything that can be converted into an algorithm will not be a job for human beings then what will be our jobs we can imagine we can be creative we have emotions we can express ourselves in a multitude of ways which probably machines will not be able to do imagination also needs to needs to be enhanced uh and it needs to be trained it needs to be explored it needs to grow rather than crushed everything whether we develop ai whether a child chooses to get into technology maybe as a career and chooses ai machine learning will develop rest of it what is the child going to put in there creativity and imagination whatever careers will blossom will have a lot of integration of art in them liberal arts is already a part of college education and it's becoming more and more popular as you would have heard now how how do we use art and different art forms to ensure learning we have time constraints we have all those challenges but still this is very key speak with sketch um sketching and speaking or art or or simple what we understand is painting and drawing and art of course is a way of expressing and instead of just talking we can use it in multiple ways in cartoon strips in normal sketches in in ways that uh children do represent ideas in the form of uh drawn art uh you could think of for example a project on different cartoon artists that existed in india uh the popular ones and how they worked and what kind of uh political ideas they explored and why and how what are the nuances within that now they could draw alongside and they could represent it in their drawing and you could pick any 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 concept from within 
uh, what you're teaching and it can be represented in the form of art. Have many of you may have heard of dance science. If you haven't, do explore. I have put in some, uh, some videos, uh, video links towards the end. How dance and science can be really combined to teach science as well as of course dance. And how, just imagine how interesting that could get. Theater and education is an already existing phenomenon. Theater is one of the best tools that's possibly there in the hands of a teacher. Uh, the image that you see here uh, is a freeze frame. Now, what if we have a frozen frame and we are able to do thought tracking? We tell children, okay, what do you think this girl here is thinking? Track the thoughts. What else do you think she's thinking? And what more? Okay, why do you think she's thinking this? What must have happened before this? What do you think is going to happen next? These are all various kinds of thinking questions. You could place any character there, any character from history there, and, and in any kind of model, and then say, okay, do some thought tracking around it. Learning, as I said earlier, cannot be limited only to the mind. It needs to be effective and psychomotor also. It needs to be for the whole being. It can be done through our bodies. Now, what you see children doing here is creating scenarios using their bodies to show or represent certain machinery or certain phenomena or concept. Imagine the kind of learning that's happening and that will stay with them throughout because tactile and kinesthetic is important. Our, the more the sense is involved in any kind of learning, the better it will stay with us. That's, that's a given thing. Now, if you look at these art pieces, how do you think, think about how you can connect different concepts with these pieces of art? There is a castle, maybe it's a haunted castle. There is a ship, maybe you can think about Columbus. Maybe you can think about a storm. Maybe you can think about um, what happens in the ocean. Maybe we can discuss the idea of a tsunami. Maybe we can discuss some scientific concept around uh, water or wind and so on and so forth. There are hundreds and hundreds, just think, and we will find lots and lots of ideas and concepts that we are teaching that can be explored through any painting we take. These are just three examples. There is a whole plethora of different styles of art available and we can connect anything to anything. I'm just giving you ideas here. And if I were to connect this uh, from a theater and education perspective, I would, would create design plays around, maybe uh, one of the kids becomes a flower and maybe the flower has a story to tell. Maybe the story is, is something that the flower wants to tell uh, the wind or the wind is supposed to be the messenger and the story is to be told to the sun or to some other flower on some other planet and how. And is there a flower possible in another planet and so on and so forth. You can keep building on it. It's just to allow creativity to happen within you. It will happen in your classroom. That's very important. Sometimes uh, when I discuss these ideas, uh, teachers end up feeling, where is the time? But just think of with each of these, just one idea, how many concepts can you bring in together? You just have to plan accordingly in your curriculum and it, it works well. In fact, to your surprise, you will know that it indeed saves time rather than take more time. Now imagine teaching about- and instead of going through those text upon text and so on, you just use these two pictures. Can you think of narratives around this? Can you think of ways in which these two can be utilized? Just the images can be utilized to make children explore more, find out about the two ideas, the two ways in which it was dealt with and how and why evaluating thinking, thinking over, thinking back, exploring, researching, and finding out more and more. This is another way of using creative exploration. 
Another here is adding drama to science. So uh, just sharing a raft. Uh, raft is a very simple strategy we use where uh, each child has to write something uh, and we define the role. So the role could be um, parts of the plant, maybe the leaf has uh, something to say, who's the audience? Audience is probably uh, the root. The leaf has something to say to the root and uh, format, maybe the leaf wants to write a letter or maybe the leaf uh, just wants to have a dialogue with the root or maybe the leaf wants to draw something and express something or do a role play and express something, whatever, some format. And again, that can also be something that you are supposed to teach in some subject and could be in any language. And the topic could be, uh, you know, I think I am more important than you are to the plant or anything else, right? And so on and so forth. So lots and lots of ideas. This is just one idea. Now there's an image of a heart. Now you may be teaching that and think of a raft that you can use or design of your own to teach the, the various parts of the heart and whatever else you have to teach, right? How you can use it. There are so many, so many, so many different ways possible. You just have to make your own imagination run wild first. Children love it. Katha or story has been our own tradition. And can you imagine anything not becoming interesting if, if gobbled into a story? We all learn only in patterns. Our mind remembers things in patterns and therefore we remember storylines. We don't remember pure facts or concepts. We remember storylines and we remember things woven into stories. Use storytelling imaginatively. With that, okay. you create all kinds of art forms. Um, as it's all- <laughs> as is already available in our folklore, in our, uh, in our puppet shows, you have it, and in our own folk tales, the way they are told, how music is integrated into all of this. Uh, who doesn't know using of mnemonics to remember things? So how all of these can be, when we bring all of it together, learning genuinely becomes creative and critical thinking develops. Now that brings us to another idea uh, many of you may have already heard of design thinking. I can do a whole different workshop on design thinking. But here, I want you to understand how design thinking and creative thinking are so, so juxtaposed and, and very, very similar. We begin, the minute we have to design anything, we need to begin with empathy as per design thinking. We empathize, we first understand, we ask a lot of questions. We understand what, what is the requirement? What is needed? What is lacking? We research about it, find out in detail. And then we develop, look beneath the surface. What is being said and what is really meant? What is really missing from here? That kind of empathy, not just listening. Hearing is different from listening. So actually listening and listening from your heart, listening from your, not just your eyes, but also from your heart. And then being able to listen and observe beneath the surface is a part of this kind of empathy. Of course, it's a skill that we all need in life as well, but essentially think of aligning all your lessons with design thinking. Instead of you giving everything to children, start with that curiosity question. Let them do a design thinking project where you bring together a lot of ideas into that one project. From It could be from different subject areas. That moves in design thinking to defining the problem. As I said, it's not just about problem solving anymore, learning problem solving. It's also, first of all, identifying the problem and defining the problem correctly. What really is the problem? And then what is the potential solution? That is what we come to at this stage of ideation. 
we brainstorm random ideas, lots of ideas for some divergent thinking here. What can be done about it? And then you prototype or build a prototype or, or experiment with it. And then of course you test it, uh, you observe it again. Is it working, not working? And it works like a reflective uh, cycle at the same time, like the Forbes model for reflection also at the same time. Now, now if you look at this and you look at this, on the right, uh, you see the creative thinking model. And on the left, you see uh, the design thinking model. So we emphasize, we research, we ideate, prototype, implement, and learn from there. Now, when we talk about creative thinking, then you will be the same way, and then you discover, research, discover, very similar. Your ideation, your dreaming, your wondering, your imagining, and then prototype or you're designing finally, and then you're implementing or delivering, and debrief again, you're learning from the whole circle. I'm sure you see similarities. It's so, so similar. This is what creative thinking is. This is what uh, critical thinking pretty much also leads to. Now, here is a project idea. There can be a team. But here is just one, create a country. You could ask children to create a utopian uh, nation. You could ask children to create a dystopia. Uh, they have to define the land and resources. They have to define the flora and fauna. They have to talk about the history, art, and architecture. They have to talk about people and culture, the constitution for it, and the economy and growth plans and so on. Now, you could change this. You could create more. Uh, ideas into it you could you could put in your concept by by saying this is the prerequisite or these are the characters available these are some of the key characters that must be these could be characters from history uh, or these are the circumstances these are the climate conditions that are there now based on this you could design or this key circumstance or this is the situation now what can this country do or these are the key resources available now what should this country be like and so on this is just how you twist and turn it is your is how you play with it again use your creativity here but this is just one of the ways in which you can create a, a project based on the design thinking or the creative thinking and critical thinking model and all the 21st century skills. Of course, children will need to work collaboratively on ideas like this. And all the 21st century skills can be taught through this. Now, yeah, all of this is very interesting, but at the same time, sounds very tough. So this is where the Altura actually comes in. This is what Altura helps you with. It essentially, all of this, we need a lot of structure. We need a lot of guided questions. We need a lot of ideation. We need a lot of uh, resources and we need a lot of well-defined rubric. It, we need a lot of scaffolding at every stage. This is what has been beautifully built into the Altura series. Uh, it, understand it from the te technology as well as the non-technology or textbook, every kind of resource is there. Also, I have put in on this slide, some of the very interesting things you would like to watch and will give you a, a, a wider perspective on these ideas. These are two series on Netflix that you might like to watch, A Life on Our Planet, which is really talking about climate change and how it is impacting us and what, some of the, what are some of the urgent needs that we have today. And then there is the social dilemma, which again will really tell you how, uh, how and in what ways is technology or uh, artificial intelligence growing around us uh, in every aspect of our lives. Uh, we barely have spoken for about one and a half hours. Uh, how many times can you even think how many times you may have picked up your phone and checked? It doesn't let us be, it just doesn't. Technology has really gotten into everything in our lives and so on. So you re we really need to understand why and how, and how despite that, to really build that right path for ourselves and of course, the future generations. It will be wonderful 
to watch uh, Sir Ken Robinson's uh, popular video. Many of you may have already seen it. Uh, the link is there. And some useful reading on developing a teaching critical thinking. I have covered most of the ideas, but you may like to read more. So therefore that will work as a handout. Uh, do read, you have all the links here. You can copy from this uh, slide. I'll leave it on that. Any questions now? We do need some time for questions as well. Very beautifully put uh, by Mary, creativity is caught like catching waves. You can have case study based questions. Somebody's written questions can be intimidating and case studies are preferable. Yes, you can use case studies and use case study based questions. That really helps. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Amrita, if I can speak. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm Anjali Mahajan and uh, it was a marathon session for you, in fact but very articulate and uh, really worthwhile listening to you. Uh, what I, I feel that, you know, now it's time for us, basically everything boils down to who is the teacher teaching the class, isn't it? So for somewhere I feel that, can we remove the word teacher, teaching? Teaching, if it can be removed, I think a lot of problems will be solved. So yeah. anyway, thank you very much. It was pleasure listening to you. Thanks, Anjali. And uh, you're very right. Uh, I think it should always be learning in teaching rather than teaching. Yeah, teaching. Right? <laughs> Nobody can teach anything to anybody. I think in one of the slides I mentioned that, that we can't teach anything to anyone. But yes, we can learn. And everyone can learn. We can learn everything. Right? At the same time, the gurus are important. The kind of work you do is very, very special and important. So let's not uh, let that be lost. Okay, any other questions? Mridula, um, if you can check. Uh, there are as such not much questions, ma'am. Um, only the thank you messages for the wonderful sessions you already have with oh. them. It's an enriching session. I could read on the chat messages. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, you please feel free to float in your questions in case you have any questions even later. I would respond and Ridula and team can, uh, Macmillan team can help, I'm sure. And do explore all these uh, resources. You will find most of your answers anyway. Um, the world is open to us all today. Thank you. There is a uh, remark in the chat box, ma'am, that can we get the PPT? So... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, you can. If, uh, I don't know, Macmillan should decide that. I should not be the person answering that one, actually. Sure, ma'am. So you can mail it to me. And uh, I think this is the one of the person, I mean, it has just scrolled up. I don't know who was asking for this. But definitely, if you can, you know, ask your uh, Macmillan representative of your area, we will be happy to mail the PPT. So uh, Macmillan Education India, thanks each one of you for being a part of our continuous journey for inspiring the young minds of this country. Let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, our mentor of the day, Dr. Vora. This session will remain as unforgettable experience and I have to thank team Macmillan West for this, you know, uh, gathering 175 educators from the Western region at that too in the busy winter's evening. It's a wonderful coordination of the team that actually has made this event possible. Thank you, everyone, and wish you all a very wonderful evening. Thank you, Dr. Vora, and thank you, Milan Ji and Joseph Ji, and thank you, team. Thank you so Thanks. much, ma'am. Thank you, Vora, ma'am. Thank you, thank you all. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for listening. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.
and uh, to all the teachers if you have any ultra demos to come across you can you know get back in touch with your macmillan representatives we'll be happy to have the ultra demos for your schools marketing macmillan at macmillaneducation.com is our email id where you can put in your request to go for ultra demos so thank you all have a thank you ma'am good evening yeah goodbye